Hello, and welcome to episode six, the back to school episode of the Ask the Expert podcast, a podcast series featuring interviews with experts from the bleeding disorders community on the topics that matter most. I'm your host, Patrick James Lynch, and today's guest is Carrie Koenig. Carrie is the Hemophilia Federation of America's Family Programs Manager, a teacher with over 10 years experience, and the mother of a child with hemophilia. She joined Ask the Expert to discuss the most important considerations for parents and families preparing for back-to-school season, answering questions from me, as well as pre-recorded questions from community members who we spoke with during the Texas Bleeding Disorders Conference held just outside of Houston, Texas in early August. So what should parents of children with bleeding disorders be thinking about right now? What resources are available to help parents prepare for the new school year? How active should kids be in advocating for themselves with teachers, administrators, and classmates? Carrie addresses all of that and a lot more next, just after a quick word about Bloodstream Media. Just before we get to this interview with Carrie, I just want to take a minute to talk with you about what it is that I'm doing over here with Bloodstream Media and podcasting for the Bleeding Disorders community. My company, Believe Limited, started Bloodstream Media to create a network of podcasts, a a network of free audio resources for people affected by bleeding disorders. The Bloodstream podcast hits on big news, big stories, and interviews with active community members and uses contributions from the community to spotlight the various segments of our population. I co-host that with my wife, yoga instructor and doula, Natalie. The Powering Through podcast features panel conversations on obstacles, challenges, and what it takes to overcome. It features community members and special guests and is recorded in front of live community audiences. The Bloodline series is our This American Lifestyle series featuring deep dives into important community topics. Our first series on life with Von Willebrand disease is composed of over two dozen interviews with patients, clinicians, and thought leaders, and if I may, is super cool and unlike anything else that's out there. And of course, we have this podcast, Ask the Expert, featuring interviews with community experts on treatment, lifestyle, and advocacy issues. I'm really proud of what we've been able to do with these pods and the thousands of community members that we have reached through them. I think we are balancing entertainment, education, and empowerment really well and creating truly engaging, resourceful podcasts. But I need your help. I need your help to make sure that we keep reaching more people because while awareness of podcasts is at an all-time high, there are still many people who don't exactly know what they are or how to find them. And sometimes I meet community members who have never heard of podcasts, and I just know that they are exactly the type of people who would benefit from listening to Bloodstream Media's pods. So, you're listening. Obviously, you figured out how to engage with podcasts. Nicely done. Please subscribe if you haven't already. Please leave us a review on iTunes if you haven't already. And please help one person you know find their way to listening to this episode. Maybe a community parent that you know who's nervous about the new school year. Or maybe a volunteer in your local community who can help share this with more parents in your area. I'm a big proponent of the value of podcasts and a big believer in the power of community. If our community gets behind pushing out podcasts as a form of communicating, educating, and empowering one another, we'll be stronger and better for it. All right, that's the end of my pitch. Thanks for listening. And now for the interview with Carrie. So we are joined today by uh, Carrie Koenig. Carrie, good morning. Thanks for joining me. Thanks for having me. Happy to be here. Um, So we're here today to talk about getting back to school and and what parents should be thinking about as their kids are getting ready for school, any young listeners, maybe what they should be thinking about. Can you give us first a little background on you, your role in the community, and why this is a, a topic of interest and expertise for you? Sure. Um, So I'm Carrie Koenig. I'm the Family Program Manager at HFA. But more importantly, I'm a parent of a seven-year-old with severe hemophilia. And I also taught pretty much third, fourth, and fifth grade all content areas in um, the public school system here in Maryland. So going back to school for your your child with a bleeding disorder, it's scary, it's overwhelming, it's challenging, especially in those younger years. But it's a passion of mine because I've sent my child with a bleeding disorder to school, and I've been that person in school with um, some kids with some chronic challenging conditions. 
So give us a little, that's, it's a, that's a great perspective to be able to draw from, kind of both sides of the table, so to speak. Um, give us a little idea, uh, from a 10,000-foot view, what are some of the, the big considerations that, that parents should be uh, thinking about as they're preparing to go back to school? What, what, what are the priorities? So in my experience, I think the, the biggest priority is awareness passing along the information to as many adults that will come in contact with your child as possible. And that's an overwhelming task because while if if you're thinking at like very primary kindergarten level, your child has a classroom teacher, but most likely there are aides that will come in contact with him or her. Um, There's also lunchroom monitors, school nurses, secretaries. There's so many people that need to be aware that your child has a condition such as a bleeding disorder that I think as a parent, you need to um, prioritize passing that awareness along. You may only want to provide a snippet, but you also, with some of those folks, want to go a little more in-depth. I imagine conversations with physical educators would be different than conversations with school administrators, than the school nurse. Um, how how do you go about differentiating? Because you want to make sure that in that awareness process that you are doing a little bit of educating because that's important. And yet we also want to make sure that we're not overwhelming or overloading any of these individuals with extraneous information for what they need to know. So how do you go about uh, navigating that thought process? So even prior to becoming HSA's Families Program Manager, when I was teaching myself and I was educating my son's um, daycare at the time, I utilize the the customizable toolkit on HFA's website. So in that, there's a basic version, and then there's also a more in-depth version. So in my experience, I've I've spent a lot of time talking to my school nurse more in depth of what the ins and outs of the disorder is, and um, joint bleeds, and how to to um, treat them, and who to call, and and what to look out for. And I also um, I, I give a little bit more of an overview to th- to people such as the PE teacher. So at the beginning of the school year with my son, I have a meeting with the guidance counselor, his new um, classroom teacher, and the school nurse. And while I've already touched base with the school nurse, we have a, an established relationship, I, I go more on the basic side with the teacher what to be aware of and what to do if you think there's an issue or if my child has reported an issue to you. So, and from what I've experienced, I really want them to refer to the nurse. I want to rely on that school nurse to triage him. So I I try to do it as, I don't know how to word this appropriately, as formalized as I can with some background information, some education about what to look for, what to do if there's an issue, and who to contact. Who should be your main point of contact in school? Um, With somebody like the PE teacher, I I really want to sit down and and explain um, that my child can participate in almost everything. Certain activities may require some modifications and accommodations, and within that, I want that teacher to come to discuss things with me as his parent. And have you found either from your personal experience or from working with other parents in the community, any common challenges at this stage with having these conversations with the the, the various uh, school staff members and administrators? Are there any common challenges that tend to arise? And if so, what are some recommendations for how to navigate those? So one of the challenges is a lot of school systems, all of those teachers don't come back to school until a couple days before the kids walk in the door. So one of the challenges I found is just getting everybody at the table at the same time. So I try to make it an effort. As long as I meet with the classroom teacher before he comes in, I sometimes then have to meet with the PE teacher the following week while he's already there. Or again, I rely on that school nurse to pass that information along to the PE teacher if I can't get a face-to-face time with him or her. So a challenge is really time, um, scheduling, that kind of thing can be can be difficult. And another challenge is, for the most part, folks who don't know anything about bleeding disorders really just want to wrap your kid in bubble wrap, have them sit, not participate in things because of fear. So, so coming over, 
conquering that fear that naturally arises in a teacher or an administrator or an aide or somebody, an adult within the building has been very challenging. But when they build that relationship with you as a parent, they're more willing to come to you with questions and they know who you are. They know how to contact you. Have you noticed that there are any um, any particular components of, of this work that parents um, tend to uh, either not anticipate or not realize how important it is? Are there any commonly overlooked aspects of preparing your child and your family for getting back to school? Well, I think it, some of them are just um, not related to bleeding disorders. You get comfortable and you know that they're going back to school and you get comfortable with your school. So you, you sometimes don't spend that amount of time talking to the teacher as, as what you would. At least that's been my experience. I the Last year, I think I sat down with my son's teacher and I was like, hey, he's got a bleeding disorder. Here's a PowerPoint. Like I just kind of blanked and went, all right, he'll be fine because I know he's going to be fine. So that's been tricky for me. But um, I've also found that that some parents tend to give worst case scenarios to teachers and that builds fear as well. So um, just trying to, to hone in on the important stuff and really focus on what they need to do if there's an issue. That's a really good point. We want to emphasize the importance and the potential urgency for swift and intelligent action if something is to go wrong, but we want to make sure in doing that we don't leave teachers or administrators with an overwhelming sense of fear, which is always a little bit of a challenge given that we have you know, what's considered a, a rare disease, a rare disorder uh, in hemophilia and even von Willebrand disease, which isn't technically a, a rare disease or disorder by the numbers. Uh, it's misunderstood and, and largely undiagnosed. So in many regards, it, it's much the same in that way. Uh, so that's a tough balance to make sure to appropriately underscore the significance of this while also trying to do so in a way that that I guess you want to you want to come off as calm and confident and as though you as the parent are not worried um, so that you don't you know, uh, subconsciously even suggest to school staff members that they have reason to be worried. Yes, absolutely. And and that's that's a hard balance to strike because the other piece I know personally as a parent, I want my child to be able to have every experience that any other child without a bleeding disorder would have. So I find that that's a really, it's really, really difficult to to establish that balance of this is what you need to know, but without scaring people off. It's hard. It's very hard. And my advice is you got to go with your gut. If you think you need to provide more information or maybe have an alternative plan in place, then you have to do that. It's kind of like that mother's know best, like mother's intuition. You know when you, you need to step in. It reminds me of what my hematologist used to say to me about about my body and just advocating in the clinical setting in general, you know your body better than anyone else. Because um, I, I would sometimes as a kid especially want to defer, defer, and just ask, well, what do you think? And she would often throw it back on me. Well, what, what are you feeling? You know your body best and, you know, trust that intuition. She was right, but it took a long time of kind of hearing that to remember that, oh, yeah, I can trust myself. I, she's right. I do know my body better than anyone else. Um, so we have some questions from our, our podcast was at the Texas Bleeding Disorders Conference, and we were meeting with parents and, and family members, uh, community members down there, and um, told them about this upcoming episode. And we have various questions that were submitted at that conference. So I'm going to play one of those for you now and give you a chance to respond to that. Great. Thanks. My name is Laura Portales. I wanted to know how you advocate for yourself. Do you already have your 504 letter to take back to school? So the question here is about the 504 letter. You can maybe um, give us a little more information as to what that exactly is. And I, I think it gets to a larger question about um, paperwork. You know, it's one thing to go into school and, and, and be advocating, you know, person to person. But what kind of paperwork should parents be prepared to bring to school? Great. Um, so a 504 plan is a document that's in place that is a non-discrimination document. And it's a health-related issue. So a 504 is something that any parent can re request if they have a health condition that could potentially affect 
um, any one of their major life activities at any time. So a bleeding disorder, for example, can affect your child's ability to walk. If they have a bleed in their ankle or knee, they could potentially come to school. And because bleeding disorders are so unpredictable, as a teacher and as a parent, I highly recommend a 504 plan. So with the 504 plan, it provides accommodations, so physical or instructional accommodations. And accommodations are how a child learns, not what a child learns. So my son has a 504 plan. He's in second, he's going to be in second grade. And on it, there's only a couple of things, but I, I felt as though these things allow him to access the curriculum to its fullest. So one of the things on it is if there are any physical restrictions, either in place by me as a parent or by um, a physician, they have to be followed. So it's just a check system that is federally mandated. And the thing with a 504 plan, speaking to her question, is 504 plans must be reviewed annually. Same with an IEP. You have to sit down with whoever the 504 administrator um, manager is within the school and the child's teacher to make adjustments to the plan itself. So as my son grows, I envision this plan following him from kindergarten the whole way through 12th grade and adding to it depending upon what his needs are and how they change. Within the 50 plan, in order to receive one, you have to have documentation from a physician that there is a medical condition that limits some sort of life activity. Bleeding disorders, like I said, they can do limit a life activity at any time. So in terms of the order of operations, um, what, what are the steps that you should be taking? Do you contact the school first about uh, identifying who the, the, the individual responsible for overseeing that in the district is? Do you get the paperwork from your HTC first? What, what are the tangible steps people should take? If you have a hospital letter, for example, from your HTC that gives instructions if you're away and there's an issue, this is something you can use to schedule a 504 meeting with, or you can contact them. In terms of what comes first, I think you should contact the school first. In my experience, it's been you call the, the school, you talk to the secretary, you request a 504. You can also write a letter if you're in the middle of the school year, because I know there are areas um, of the US that they've already gone back to school. So if you think your child could benefit from having a 504 plan, you can write a letter to his or her teacher requesting a 504 meeting. Within that meeting, you'll meet with the 504 team, which is always your child's classroom teacher, an administrator, guidance counselor, whoever is the manager is um, within that building, you as the parent, and sometimes the school nurse. That is your time to educate the team about your child's bleeding disorder, to go into even the nitty gritty of it and discuss some accommodations that could benefit your child. Like I said, Nicholas has very minimal accommodations on his, but they're of value. If there's a physical restriction that we need to, to have in place, it has to be followed. And then you'll kind of discuss how these things impact his or her education. And together, in, even in one meeting, sometimes you can develop and implement that 504 plan immediately. So the school will have its own framework for creating this 504 plan, but you have to approve all of the accommodations. Excellent. Excellent information. All right, let's go on to another question on a different topic. And I will play that for you right now. Great. This is Diamond McClurkin. And my question is, um, what age should you let your child become empowered to tell his friends, his teachers, his coaches about their bleeding disorder? So great question. And the kind of question that it feels like you got to immediately uh, put an asterisk and say, your experience may vary. Every family's different. Every child is different. Every situation is different. But in, in, in general, how does a parent think about that moment when you want to start encouraging your child to be more vocal with classmates, with teachers? How, how, well, how have you in your personal experience navigated that? So currently my son, he's seven, he is not ready to really disclose his bleeding disorder to his friends. And part of that is he's not developmentally ready to really understand all of the pieces. He has a good foundation, but he's just not there yet. 
some of his closer friends, like our neighbors and such, know that he has a bleeding disorder. They know that he has a port. They know that he wears a medical alert bracelet. They know all these things. But when we go to school, he is not ready to tell a lot of his friends about it. He has one friend in particular that he was in class with in kindergarten and first grade who knows about it. And he chose to disclose that himself and did it kind of in passing. He asked about his port and he was like, oh, that's where I get my medicine because I have hemophilia. And he did that himself. So from a teacher standpoint and from a parent standpoint, I, I kind of think that's really individual. If your child's ready to talk to his or her friends and disclose that information with them, let them. If they're not, they're not. But when it comes to teachers and coaches, I think as the parent, you need to continue to advocate for your child until they are prepared to do so. With some support and maybe some coaching, I taught third, fourth, and fifth grade. I spent the bulk of my time in fifth grade. And at that age, the parents really were encouraging their child to come to me and, and discuss things with me. But they were also doing it at the same time. So they were almost like duplicating efforts. And that was providing that support and scaffolding for their child to, to advocate for themselves, but also not missing any pieces. So I think it is very individual, but it's important to, to provide opportunities and to encourage and coach your child to advocate for themselves when you think they're getting of age to be ready to do so. You know, that idea of kind of doing it in tandem, parent and child, and as you put it that the scaffolding that occurs with knowing that if the fifth grader missed any important details the parent is also there as well it reminds me of um, what I share with uh, parents when they ask about how, at what age should my child start um, taking responsibility for their own medication and you know uh, self-infusing and and all of that and I've always said I, I think it's useful to as soon as they're interested have them um, put away the syringes in the closet where the syringes are organized. And then as they get comfortable with that, have them put away all the supplies. And as they're comfortable with that, have them unpack the box of factor when it arrives. And then when they're comfortable with that, have them make the phone call. You just kind of incrementally utilize their interest in the process while still filling in all the gaps as needed until they are ready to fully own that themselves. It's a similar kind of consideration, it sounds like, in, in the school setting. Mm -hmm, absolutely, yes. And, you know, it gets to a larger um, area of consideration for going back to school. We talked a, a good bit now about discussing with administrators and staff and teachers, but there's also, as a parent, the need to talk to your child about the upcoming school year, and not just because of your bleeding disorder, but just because it's school and it's social dynamics, and there's all kinds of considerations. What are some of the ways that parents um, should be thinking about how to have conversations with their kid to prepare them for the school year ahead in general? Well, I think you really need to prepare them for a, a schedule change. In the summer, we tend to get a little lazy and um, don't want to get out of bed as early. So preparing them in that realm without them even realizing you're doing it, getting them up a little earlier. And I think it just has to be a conversation. Well, when you go back to school, this is what's changing. Um, when you go back to school, when you come home, you're going to do your homework. It's kind of having these conversations and mentally preparing your child for that toss back into the, the school year, I think is helpful. It doesn't come as much of a shock to them when all of a sudden on a Monday morning, they're having to get up a lot early, eat breakfast, get dressed, go to school, come home and do homework. Like, I, I think when you prepare them a little bit, like a week or two in advance, waking them up a little earlier, decreasing TV and like tablet, iPad, screen time, that type of stuff, I think, just prepares them for them not without them even really being aware of it. Yeah, it's a slow kind of uh, gradually onboarding to this new schedule shift as opposed to that stark difference out of nowhere. Yeah, it's almost like gradually training. All right, let's go to uh, another question from a community member. My name is Jules. When is the appropriate time in health class to bring up the bleeding disorder? So the question about when's the appropriate time in health class to bring up your bleeding disorder, um, and I, I think a little more broadly, it, it seems as though often hemophilia first comes up or bleeding disorders kind of first come up in a 
formal classroom setting in a health class or biology class when there's a conversation about X-linked inherited disorders. That seems to be a time where you hear feedback from people all around the country that um, hemophilia and bleeding disorders first get brought up, but often inaccurately. Um, and I've heard I've heard this many times. I'm sure you have as well. So, just to kind of specify that question a little further, if if your child's in a room where hemophilia is being spoken about incorrectly, or von Willebrand disease is being spoken about incorrectly, how should you prepare your child to uh, uh, handle that and, and move forward with that? So that's like a great question. I can distinctly remember being in seventh or eighth grade. I don't remember what year it was. And I was taking a biology class of some sort and we were doing genetics and my teacher wasn't doing it accurately. And I remember being like, I'm sorry, that's not doing X-linked hemophilia. Like that's not right. I remember speaking up. So I think um, when you're talking about how to express your experiences or to spread that awareness and your knowledge, I think there's a way to do it without disclosing you have a bleeding disorder yourself, you could ex explain, you know, what hemophilia is or what von Wildebrand's is or, or platelet disorder, any rare disorder when you're discussing um, the components of blood. You, you can do it at that time and share that piece. And even if you feel comfortable saying, oh, it's, it's in my family or um, it's something that I've learned a lot about over the years, you, you can do that without disclosing. And I think Again, it really is specific to what the health class is about. Now, it, you could even discuss it when you're talking about joints and, and movement and um, issues within um, joints in general. You could discuss a bleeding disorder then. It really is specific to what is being taught at the time. But I think spreading that knowledge and, that, and awareness, I think, is, is part of being a good advocate. And on, on the flip side, when when we are open about something that makes us different than our peers in any way, or if we're at school, and I, I remember, especially in my middle school years, as you were stating earlier, one day, you know, I'd be on crutches, the next day I'm in a wheelchair, the day after that I'm walking just fine, and, you know, kids have trouble kind of comprehending how that's possible, um, you can become a target. Um, and, you know, we hear about bullying in schools, and the, the, the trouble that comes with bullying and, and how do you curb it? How do you even get a handle on it if you're an adult? How do you even make sure you're seeing it? What can you do about it? Um, how, do you, uh, how do you negotiate that when you have a bleeding disorder and you disclose in one way or another, either verbally or your body does it for you because you're obviously managing a bleed, how do you help your child prepare to not feel less than in one way or another? I think the more your children see that bleeding disorders are, are one, it's one piece. There are so many other conditions that affect so many other people. Um, and in the school environment, you will see lots of other issues that kids have. And I think as a parent with somebody with a bleeding disorder, I, I make more note of that. So it's hard to, to explain this without coming off a little strange, but I think pointing that out to your child, like, oh, do you remember so-and-so? He has X, Y, Z. Or do you remember the, the girl in the wheelchair um, that uses a wheelchair in school? She has something else. Like, we all have our own, and nobody's perfect. We all have a story, and we all have a background. And there are issues everywhere. And bleeding disorders are just a little more rare than others. So I think it's empowering your children and um, building that self-confidence in them that they're not alone, that there are other kids with other more significant, more difficult issues. And having them be aware of that can be really powerful. And it's hard. Bullying is, is such a heavy thing. And, and you're seeing it more now on um, through social media. And there are just so many other outlets where kids are connected to each other. And it's scary in certain respects. But I think the more that you bridge that gap with your kids and have open lines of communication about it and, and make sure that your kids know who they can talk to at school, who their allies are, and um, I think they're better prepared and, and more able to manage situations that could arise. Excellent. All right, let's go to one last question from community. This one's a little outside the, the scope of what we've been discussing thus far, but it's, it's an intriguing question. 
Um, so let's let's give it a listen. Hola, mi nombre es Celia Patiño. Mi pregunta es, ¿cómo se preparaban las generaciones pasadas para ir a la escuela? My question is, I wanted to know how the older generation prepared for school with hemophilia. So as I think we as a community are well aware, life with hemophilia in the U.S. in 2017 is much different than, say, in 1977, much different than 1967. Um, so the question is, what was life with hemophilia or school, going to school with hemophilia like for the older generation? And just before we start recording, uh, you had mentioned, while this is not necessarily a, a topic that you're uh, an expert on, so to speak, um, you do have personal experience or have some personal anecdotes through your family of what life with hemophilia was like as a kid uh, for those in the quote unquote older generation. Can you speak to that a little bit? So, yeah, my father has hemophilia, and he's not much of a sharer. He doesn't um, – he's come out more with some of the stories and some of his experiences since I've had my son, but he's been very private about things, and um, I would get bits and pieces from him. I do know that going to school and preparing for school was a, way more challenging than what it is today. We have the benefit of these – protections that that we can as parents utilize to help keep our kids safe in school such as 504s and even possibly an IP but at the time those were not available so my my father missed a lot of school and for a, a short time in his school career he went to a parochial school and he wasn't necessarily afforded the opportunity to make up some of the work that he lost and so he found that he was really far behind. He spent a lot of time in hospitals because there wasn't proper treatment for his bleeding disorder. So he really was, was lacking in a lot of it. And I know my grandmother had told me stories about how um, some of his teachers would give him extra copies of books and that he could bring home and, and have at home so he didn't have to carry everything, especially if he ha was on crutches one day. Um, but I know that what my grandmother did for my father was very similar to what I do for my son. He, she made sure that she was in the school talking to his teachers, talking to the school nurse, talking to the guidance counselor about his condition. And, and she even advocated for him to have some accommodations. Like a, um, there was an elevator at the time. So when he was in high school, he got to have a key to the elevator instead of having to walk up the three flights of stairs. So, that's how she prepared. She did it exactly the same way. And she didn't have the resources that, that we have today, such as the, the um, back to school toolkit on our website. She had to do it herself. So it's very different. Um, and in some respects, it's a lot easier. So, Carrie, we've covered a lot of ground. You've brought it up a couple of times, uh, the HFA Back to School Toolkit. Uh, just in, in summary here, can you define a little more specifically what that toolkit is, what it entails, and where people can find it? Sure. Um, so the Back to School Toolkit I refer to as a living, breathing toolkit. It is a toolkit on our um, – it's on hemophiliafed.org by the way, it is a huge compilation of a ton of different resources in which as parents, as students, you can utilize to help get your child ready to go back to school, navigate some maybe issues you're having within the school system itself. And because I refer to this as a living, breathing toolkit, it is constantly being updated. We're always working on new resources and things that we think can help empower our um, our parents and students to be good advocates. And within this toolkit, a couple of the pieces that I really want to highlight are the customizable presentations. These are where you can go in and input your personal, your child's personal information to then help to educate your child's school about the bleeding disorder. There is already some information in it, and we have a more of a basic version that I prefer to use with teachers and, and PE teachers. Uh, maybe like the secretary, some, some of your more um, prominent points of contact. And then there's like an in-depth version for the school nurses. And it goes into what to look for for a bleed, how to treat it, and such. We have a hemophilia one, a von Wildebrand's one. And in this toolkit, we also have some webinars that, have, that were recorded um, about some protections and how to navigate the school system. 
We also have some just downloadable resources, and one of our newest ones is a flow chart to help identify what type of protection your child really needs. Do they need an IEP? Do they need a 504? A set of reasonable accommodations that, that could be um, provided to your child if needed. Some examples of IEPs, individual health plans, 504s. So it's really just a huge living, breathing document with resources, webinars, articles, um, like I said, the customizable presentations. And this toolkit is really a resource for you. So um, I hope that you really take a look at it and take advantage of some of those resources that are available to you. And as Carrie said, you can find it on hemophiliafed.org uh, in the resource library under toolkits. There's the back to school toolkit. We'll have links in the program notes for this episode as well in your podcast player and with the episode on bloodstreamexpert.com. Uh, Carrie Koenig, the Families Program Manager for the Hemophilia Federation of America, thank you so much for coming on to discuss this very timely topic, and good luck to you and your family as you're preparing for the back-to-school season and setting those alarm clocks for a little bit earlier in the morning. I know. It's coming so quickly. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Happy to be here. A big thanks once again to Carrie Koenig for coming on Ask the Expert to talk about back-to-school. I hope there were a couple of pieces of information in there that were valuable to you and maybe something that you can share with somebody else. Again, you will find a link to HFA's Back to School Toolkit as well as more information on 504 plans, something Carrie spoke very highly of, in the program notes for this episode, which are located in your podcast player and in the episode description accompanying this episode on bloodstreamexpert.com. That's all for Episode 6 of the Ask the Expert podcast series. We'll be back next month with another expert interview. Bloodstreammedia.com is your one-stop shop for all of Bloodstream Media's podcasts for the bleeding disorders community. Once on Bloodstreammedia.com, don't forget to follow the links and subscribe to the Bloodstream podcast, the Ask the Expert podcast, and the Powering Through podcast, as well as the Bloodline podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, or wherever it is you listen to podcasts. Have an idea for a future episode of Ask the Expert? Have a question that you would like to hear an expert answer? Email us at mailbag at bloodstreammedia.com. You'll also find Bloodstream Media on Facebook, facebook.com backslash Bloodstream Media, and on Twitter at Bloodstream Info. This episode of Ask the Expert was written by Patrick James Lynch, produced by Patrick James Lynch, Rob Bradford, Andrew Gall, Josh Bragg, Avra Friedman, and Colby Crow. And the Ask the Expert podcast is edited by Mr. Andrew Gall. Special thanks to Carrie Koenig, the Hemophilia Federation of America, and the Texas Bleeding Disorders Conference and Community. I am your host, Patrick James Lynch, and until next time, take self-care of yourself.